Good morning, everybody. Which speaker of the day does not require any formal introduction is only known to us, unknown to the entire legal fraternity. And the topic today is uh, very interesting: a statutory framework on works in India, Muslims Act of 1923. And uh, um, Sanjay is the best person to speak on this subject. Um, Sanjay, the forum is yours. You can start. Thank you. Thank you, Raghavan. Good morning, uh, friends. I mean, I'm I'm going to have uh, give a going to follow a chronological manner in which the legislatures, both province as well as the central legislatures, have interfered. when it came to wafs uh, last time we noticed i mean for those who had not uh, last time we had i just give a short uh, introduction uh, before the waf act of 1954 was enacted it was preceded by several uh, provincial as well as uh, central legislative uh, central legislations the privy council had taken a view that uh, waf al laula we which we will see during the course of the lecture on more than one occasion was uh, was not considered uh, islamic according to the british judges therefore it was held to be illegal now wafal al aulad is a manner in which a waqif that is the person who writes the waf nama or the waf deed uh, gives the property to his descendants and on the extinguishment of all these heirs it finally goes to something which is religious charitable or pious now this was held to be not valid under muslim law by uh, the privy council therefore the first statutory interference was the usman waf validating act of 1913 um this said, this was in a form of a declaratory manner which said that the usman waf the the uh, the waf al aulad shall be valid on and from the date of which the Uh, enactment came into force therefore the parliament had the, the legislature had to make another uh, legislation again which is the muslimon waf uh, act of uh, muslimon waf act of 1913 muslimon of validating act of 1930 now these these two legislations we had already seen on the last occasion it dealt with muslimon waf act uh, subsequently the, uh, the this this led with the wafal al aula but it did not deal with the public wafs therefore in so as public wafs are concerned a statutory framework was brought in by way of the muslimon waf act of 1923 now if you go, this legislation is hardly 13 paragraphs the 13 sections and if you read the uh, in, in fact you can finish reading the entire enactment in within less than 1 minute it is <laughs> said that a mutawalli of a, uh, that the waf must be registered with the court there was no waf board must be registered with the court and the mutawalli must furnish details as regards the extent of the waf the income of the waf and he must file the same before the concerned district court now before the district this the entire idea for a waf legislation was the civil court was already being uh, extremely overburdened so to put the burden back on the civil court did not make sense but the central legislature in 1923 made that uh, Move saying that if a mutawalli wants to uh, show the accounts, audit the accounts, he will have to file it before the uh, district court. Now there was a problem in this because the it gave this the act itself gave provision for exemption from any of these provisions of the act. Therefore, while the first restrictive move on the part of the mutawalli came in through the door. the restrictions went out through the window because it was left to the administrative discretion of the of the central government and the state bank now this was one the second it was not very effective because if for income more than rupees 2000 the central government would appoint uh, uh, the government will appoint a audit officer and for wafs less than rupees 2000 the court had to appoint a special officer now we are speaking about 1923 in 1923 2000 rupees had a value and number of wafs which had an income of more than 2000 were many and the courts were already burdened therefore invariably this legislation i would say was brought in to satisfy the demands of uh, control on the powers of the mutawalli and at the same time it also gave enough enough and more loopholes for them to escape therefore this did not uh, satisfy the 
requirements of law or uh, the public. Now, one thing to be noticed is, as the WAF law of WAFs has developed, the, the constitutional provisions have, have also changed. Now, the Musalman WAF of 1923, Musalman WAF Act of 1923, was made when the Government of India Act of 1919, now, it, uh, this is also a constitutional act, like the Government of India Act of 1935, was in force. Now, the central government had the power. The provisional legislature uh, did not have any power. Therefore, the provinces started protesting. Then came the Government of India Act of 1935. Now, under the Government of India Act of 1935, the responsibility with respect to trust and the charitable endowments, as well as religious and religious endowments, was left, with, left on the burden of uh, the provincial legislature. That is entry 34, list 2 of 7th schedule of the Government of India Act gave the power to the provincial legislature with respect to charity and charitable endowments and religious and religious endowments. Now, insofar as the trust and trustees itself are concerned, that came under entry 9, list 3 of 7th schedule. Therefore, invoking this power, the central legislature enacted the uh, subsequent legislations. Now, corresponding sections, which is equivalent to Article 234 or, uh, of the Constitution of India of 1950, is Section 100 of the Government of India Act of 1935. Now, in exercise of this power, the central legislature, the, the state of uh, Bengal, was not satisfied. The state of Bengal said this is no legislation at all. And remember, at that point of time, more than the Punjab uh, aspect of Punjab portion of uh, United India, which is Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan in 1934, but there were majority area was also the present day Bangladesh and West Bengal. Therefore, the government of West Bengal said, We don't want the Muslim Act of 1923, which is uh, a toothless tiger, to govern our WAFs. And they passed a special legislation, a provincial legislation called the Bengal Waf Act of 1934. Now, this is a, a landmark in the law of WAFs because it is for the first time a commissioner was contemplated and a WAF board was also contemplated with a fixed term. Now, the, this, uh, it also for the first, the, the Bengal Waf Act also for the first time contemplated payment of 5% of the income of the WAF towards audit fees. Before that, it was to the, as I, I had already stated, it was to the discretion of the judge and uh, for WAFs of income less than rupees 2000 and the discretion of the government for uh, WAFs which have income of more than 2000. But for the first time, a board was contemplated, 5% uh, uh, income was being charged, and the Mutawalis were restricted in dealing with the alienations of the property. This is the first. Uh, I would say the forerunner for the subsequent WAF Act is the Bengal WAF Act of 1934. Now, uh, this, this act was found uh, uh, very useful. And within two years, the United Provinces, which is today the a part of present part of Uttar Pradesh, the United Provinces Act, WAF Act of 1936 was enacted. This was also followed by the Delhi WAF Act of 1946. And subsequently, the Bihar Waf Act of 1947. Now, if you take the United India, I mean, just imagine, visualize the map of India in 19, prior to 1947, you will find most of these territories are covered the majority part, the Bengal till Assam down to Orissa. The middle part, the heart of India was the uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, United, which is today Uttar Pradesh, then called United Provinces. Below it is the kingdom of uh, the Nizam of Hyderabad. And you had the Delhi portion of the Delhi WAF Act. So literally, for uh, more than 50% of the uh, country, it was now ruled by, the WAFs are now governed by the statutory enactments brought in by state legislatures or provincial legislatures, which had some teeth. The, they all of them followed the example of the Bengal WAF Act. Now here, that I must also point out that the statutory frame, while all statutes dealt with WAFs in general, one particular WAF, which has always been given a special treatment, is the Ajmer Darga. 
that is the khwaja sahib darga khwaja sahib uh, which is uh, which belongs to chistia sect of uh, sufis in uh, ajmer now uh, those of you who visited ajmer would have noticed that this is the place where akbar wanted uh, had gone to meet uh, the saint and uh, in if you see there will be an ajmeri gate in delhi and there will be a delhi gate in ajmer so this has already this has always been a special this darga has always had a special place in uh, india especially in northern india and uh, punjab including uh, pakistan portions of pakistan that are there today and so far as this darga is concerned the darga sahib act of 1936 was brought in i will this darga khwaja sahib act of 1936 was implemented and it led to more disputes among the kadims or uh, their kadim basically means a servant but today they are controlling the uh, institution uh, justice uh, gulam hasan was appointed as a to go look into it now justice gulam hasan finds that he writes in his uh, report which is submitted to the government of india sometime in 19 uh, late 1940 something 1950 you should read a you should read the report he says that is the reason why the darga khwaja sahib act of 1955 came into force he says today if a pilgrim <coughs> goes to ajmer the kadims pile on one another and pull the uh, devotee to himself literally making it sound as if it was more a money making exercise and that required immediate interference considering the import of that institution the say, parliament has Made a separate legislation. Originally, the legislation was made by the central legislature. That is the Dwada Darga Khwaja Sahib Act of 1936, Act 20 of 1936, and today it is being controlled by the Darga Khwaja Sahib Act of 1955. Now, uh, this I, I told you the Muslim Anwar Act of 1923 was a half-baked legislation, which threw the matters back into court, and therefore. it didn't solve the mischief for which it was made so the demand started going in and the, uh, the, the this one <laughs> one beauty of it is it was it started off as a private member bill jamaat e islami hind went and met uh, uh, one sm ahmed Kaz, kazi he tabled the present framework in 1952 in the parliament as a private member bill after maulana abul kalam azad took over the uh, uh, took over and adopted that private member bill as a bill of the congress party and moved it and that is that became the waf act 1954 now what why what is the what is the speciality of waf act of 1954 and what were its deficiencies now in so far as the waf act of the deficiency of the waf act of 1954 i would say is the restrictive meaning that has been given to the word waf or aukafs by the legislation itself now uh, when the prior to the waf act of 1954 any person belonging to any creed any religion any sex could create a waf now this was the definition as per i mean any any in fact jews have created uh, waf and i also pointed out before that prior to the uh, waf the musliman waf act of 1923 i'll give the since all of most of us are in tamil nadu i'll give the example of the nagur darga the lands belonging to nagur darga nearly 200 acres were given by the brother of uh, krishna devaraya to shahu lamid auliya now the brother that is king achuda devaraya was suffering from acute uh, stomach pain and he had consulted several people and he didn't get a solution at all then shahul amid auliya came along and he said uh, i can cure and uh, he cured him they it goes that while he was uh, uh, praying he came across the uh, image of a pigeon with a lot of uh, pins in it so one by one he removed the pins and one by one the pain of the king went away the king was so happy that he gave the entire nagur darga that is the 200 acres of land where the saint is uh, buried was given by a hindu king a hindu king that is krishna krishna devaraya's brother now 
but if if we, this is the example the next example i would go is the present uh, university which is the alia university in uh, calcutta was not founded by a muslim it was founded by a christian that is a uh, lord uh, sir uh, warren hastings who was then the governor general and for one year for the mother sir he was paying the salary he was literally he was maintaining it then those of you who have gone to north india would have heard about the ramjas college now ramjas college was founded by rai sahib kedarnath uh, district judge in punjab judicial service i'm talking about Uni united punjab judicial service which included pakistan portions of uh, west pakistan as well as uh, east pa uh, east west punjab as well as east punjab now it, the, he was a hindu after dedicating the uh, waf he had a havan ceremony and said i am giving education which is a religious purpose which is a religious and charitable purpose as per islam and he created a waf those who have stayed in north india will know there is place is called ramjas uh, college ramjas college is a waf now it's another thing how interpretation went etc but i am confirming giving it for the purpose of saying that the first Uh, mistake that the waf act of 1954 did was adopting the definition of the waf as given by the british go british government under the muslim waf act of 1913 it literally copied it and by virtue of it uh, the uh, uh, waf which could not could not be created by a, uh, a non muslim this was the first uh, difficult i'll read the definition that uh, amir ali gives for respect to who can create a waf uh, professor amir ali says after referring to original text any person or whatever creed may cre of whatever creed may create a waf but the law requires that the object for which the dedication is made should be lawful according to the creed of the dedicator as well as the islamic doctrine divine approbation being essential in the constitution of a waf if the object for a dedication is made a simple either according to the laws of islam or the creed of the dedicator it would not be valid therefore if if, if the definition had been uh, see how the definition stands today is permanent dedication of any person professing islam uh, of any property considered by the muslim faith as religious charitable or pious had it been included as any person any person who creates a, a charity or a religious or the thing according to his religion and which is acceptable to islamic doctrines is a waf that would have given an extended uh, uh, meaning or the actual meaning for which how islamic law has been treating the definition of law of books throughout now this comes on the, thereafter we uh, in so far as the states are concerned uh, they did find i'll give an example of the state of madras state of madras objected to this restrictive definition and brought in the uh waf madras waf supplement act of 1961 this legislation made it clear that a person who is a non muslim also can dedicate a property in support of a waf now this is in order to prevent objections from persons where non muslims had already dedicated properties and the mutawalli shouldn't be shouldn't use this uh, restricted um, uh, definition given under the waf act of 1961 and fitter away the property now the one the, the uh, under the waf act of 1954 uh, a, a body was contemplated which is called the commissioner of survey the commissioner of survey uh, in practicality was a senior ias officer and under him there were several assistant uh, survey com commissioners uh, commis commissioner of survey is the head of head who was sitting in chennai Jobs is continues to be in Chennai, and the he was assisted by assistant commissioner of surveys. The assistant commissioner of surveys were also drawn from the revenue department. The idea, the the purpose of having created a commissioner of surveys, this is under section four, five, and six of the WAF Act of 1954, which more or less corresponds to section four, five, or six of the WAF Act of 1995. The commissioner of surveys could. go and find out through his officers to go and find out what is the extent of the waf what was the nature of the waf whether it is uh, shia or sunni what is the purpose of dedication whether it was religious charitable or uh, religious charitable or pious and details of the waf were given details of the alienations were noted 
and whether what was the income that it was an extensive survey now after the survey the commissioner of works had to submit a report to the state government i pointed out earlier during my uh, uh, talk that the state governments which were excluded previously slowly started gaining power now the the uh, today the section 4 5 and 6 the appointment was made by the state government and not by the central government therefore the report was submitted by the commissioner of works to the state government and which in turn sent the report to the wf board it is only after 1954 the wf board was formed and the wf board was given uh, incorporation permanent seal and perpetual succession this is the first time a legal person was created by the by the, the statute now the wf act received it it was supposed to go through the and i'm sure the job was done um, it was uh, the wf act was supposed to go through the report of the commissioner of uh, surveys and the first chairman of the tamil nadu wf board is very eminent uh, person he is he was he is the father of uh, our uh, very learned justice abdul hadi and the grandfather of uh, justice abdul qudus now miran sahib had, uh, i'm told that had, uh, had asked Mr. Abdul Rasak, the person because of whom I learnt uh, WAF Act, he is the person who taught me the rudiments. Now he had uh, ensured that every report was thoroughly looked into and submitted comments to the state government. The state government, on receipt of the report, notified. This is important because of the amendments which have come in 2013. Also, please see section six. The government of Tamil Nadu. notified the or any government under section 6 was supposed to notify the uh, the name of the wf the number that was given whether it was general survey or special survey in 1954 to and 1954 to 1959 it was only general survey uh, gs number was given that is general survey number thereafter the whether the purpose of the wf was uh, enumerated all these were included in a book which is the register of wafs for those practicing in madras i could you know we call it the pro forma the pro forma of a wf is the details connected by the the assistant commissioners of survey given to the commissioner of survey turned handed over to the government confirmed by the wf board given back to the state government for notification now once it went back to the state government for notification was notified the the enactment was the, the notification was given finality subject to a challenge before the civil court again now uh, as to why they did not create a tribunal one does not know maybe that they were against tribunalization then and uh, the the in case a person that does, does not challenge the notification within a period of one year then the act itself said under section 6 the for, for the notification becomes final and cannot be challenged subsequently this became a subject matter of dispute a very interesting case which also has an interesting judgment uh, and a flip flop taken by the parliament uh, it is the it is commissioner it is radha kishan r a d h a k i s h a n radha kishan versus board of works rajasthan ar 1967 rajasthan page 1 the dispute before the commissioner of uh, the dispute before the high court was that the commissioner does not have the power to decide whether a wf is a wf property or not if there is a dispute with respect to the nature of the property so for example x gives a property as a mosque why is appointed as kolavali not a notice is sent for inquiry by the commissioner the commissioner receives the notice and after he, i mean after he receives the statement He, de he declares it to be a wf property the argument before the uh, rajasthan high court is in case there is if if there is no dispute no problem we will agree but if there is a dispute whether the property is a wf property or not then the commissioner of surveys does not have the jurisdiction to decide that issue that surprisingly came to be accepted by the uh, rajasthan high court now obviously the board of wf rajasthan was uh, asil and therefore i mean was agreed and therefore they preferred an appeal to the supreme court 
Now, the judgment of the Rajasthan High Court was uh, in uh, 1967, AR 1967, Rajasthan page 1. And the judgment of the Supreme Court came rather quickly in AR 1979, Supreme Court page 289. Now, in uh, Board of Works Rajasthan versus Radha Kishan, that is 79 Supreme Court page 289, a judgment which any student of Wafak must read, it reversed the Rajasthan High Court and held that the commissioner of WAFs can decide whether a property is a WAF property or not, whether it is a Shia WAF or a Sunni WAF, on all questions that are raised in that uh, in this regard. Now, once that was held, held so, the issue came was whether a limitation will apply under Section 6 to a third party. Now, insofar as the limitation is concerned, the Supreme Court took a view that this limitation is uh, should not apply because it should apply only to persons who are put on notice of the survey by the commissioner. One might have purchased the property without notice. He might be, he might suddenly be, he cannot be told that you have lost your right to challenge the notification since one year has passed and this is a special limitation. Supreme Court said, uh, if you are a person who has not been put on notice, the period of limitation will be as per the regular limitation act. Now, the period as per the regular limitation act was 12 years. Now, please note, I, I said the flip-flop because the parliament came out with an amendment saying, if a person who is not a mutawali is aware, is put on notice by the commissioner of WAFs, stating that this inquiry is to be held, and he is aware of the inquiry and does not attend, or attends and does not give any evidence, this limitation will apply to him also. This was objected to surprisingly by members of Muslim members of the Muslim community in Rajya Sabha in 1984, and this was not this was not notified. When the WAF Act of 1995 came into force, this was in fact notified. It was Section 6 proviso. A specific provision was included in under the uh, WAF Act of 1995, where under it said that for persons who are aware that the explanation. Uh, to ex explanation to section 6 under section 6 1 it gave the it said in case a person um, in respect to any property of list of works shall include every person who though not interested in the work property concerned is interested in such property and to whom a reasonable opportunity had been afforded to represent this case by notice served on him in this behalf during the course of inquiry under section 4 now, so therefore, uh, judgment in Radha Krishnan was watered down. Uh, the basis of the judgment of Radha Krishnan was removed. And they said, if you are a third party and the commissioner of office has put you on notice and you are given a reasonable opportunity and still the WAF has been de declared as a, and the property has been declared as a WAF property by the state government, the period of limitation before which you should challenge is one year. Now, if the basis of the Supreme Court judgment was removed by a statutory uh, intervention in 1984, not notified, 1995, surprisingly, this was excluded on and from 111 2013. Therefore, though the parliament interfered after the judgment in Radha Kishan, it has now, we have now gone back to the situation of AR 1979 Supreme Court page 289, and therefore, Radha Krishnan's judgment still holds good. Now, the next special, this is the first time the special limitation was brought under the WAF Act, that is under Section 6. The second uh, speciality was an institution called the Central WAF Council was created. Now, this Central WAF Council was created by way of an amendment in 1964. When it was introduced by a private member bill by uh, S.M. Kazmi, uh, I pointed out in 1952 to repeal the Muslim Act of 1923. The what was contemplated was a private body advise the central government. Now, in 1964, when the WAF Amendment Act was introduced, they said it doesn't make sense to have a private body to advise the central government. Let us have a body which will be appointed by the central government, which will. Uh, advise the uh, which will advise the central government as to what to do with works and works properties. 
Now I went through certain records, and uh, the uh, the then Tamil Nadu Waf Board chairman has taken a view that the Central Waf Council is the fifth wheel of a cart. Very subtly put, in other words, stating that the Central Waf Council is uh, not useful for administration of wafts in the country. That very subtly put. I like the I like the, we had used the term. It is the fifth wheel of a cart. Now in uh, unlike the uh, uh, the uh, Bengal legislation in 19. This was the second aspect, where even it is even today we have the Central Waf Council, and under the 1990 Act, I'll come to that subsequently. Now under the uh, 1954 Act, they they did not they found the uh, unlike the Bengal example, they did they they found they gave the power to the state government to form a separate board of works for Shias. And a separate board of bus for Sunnis. Uh, it's only the Uttar Pradesh government which has, to my knowledge, two separate uh, buff boards, who more often than not are at each other's throat. Uh, Bengal legislation, I pointed out, the Bengal uh, Waf Act of 1930 did not have any such provision. Therefore, it was the first time the Shias were given a voice, an independent voice, um, on normally on a globe. Across the globe, it, it is found that the Shias constitute 15%, close to about 15% of uh, the followers of the faith, and 85% of the uh, Sunnis. It, listening to the aspirations of the uh, Shias, a separate waf, uh, the state, the 1954 Act, contemplated a separate waf board for the Shias also. Um, so for the first time, that representation was given. To members of the parliament, to members of the state legislatures, bar council, and to mutawallis. Now, the uh, prior to this, uh, the report was entitled "Discretion of the Government," and prior to 1954, there was no waf board, and therefore it was entirely the discretion of the judge. It is under Section 15 of the Waf Act of 1990, uh, 1954. Which is substantially the similar provision under Section 32 of the WAF Act of 1995, that you find that the WAF Board has been given vast powers to appoint and remove mutawallis, to uh, settle budget, etc. The uh, it had the WAF Board was given power to frame schemes, but uh, Justice uh, M. M. Ismail took a view that the WAF board being a statutory authority does not have the power under the 1954 act for the purpose of dealing with the schemes presented by the uh, court, civil courts. Now, schemes settled by the civil courts, any scheme settled prior to 1995 and 1954, that is the first 7th of uh, May 1954 when the act, enactment came into force, had to be only by the civil court. Because the WAF being a charity, a public charity uh, at, 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 in certain categories, had to be treated only under Section 92 of the Code of Civil Procedure of 1908 or under Section 539 of the Code of Civil Procedure, which was preceding it. Now, the, you, when the power was given to the WAF board on one hand. I would say there was a, there still is, there still is a reluctance on part of the court to give up the power which has been taken away from them statutorily. But the judgment, I would say, is you gave the power to the WAF board, who are a body of experts on one hand, and at the same time, this power was sought to be taken away by judicial interpretation. Now, the uh, in 1964 is another landmark amendment to the WAF Act of 1954, 10 years there, later, was because service inams, uh, which constitute a major portion of uh, WAF, were introduced uh, like the Kazi Inam, uh, the uh, Mashuratul Kitmat, the uh, Imam Baras. Imam Baras are uh, categories of works where a sovereign or a, or maybe a, a person claiming under a sovereign like a Zamindar would have set apart the property. Now, if you go to in Anana, in uh, Chennai, very near uh, Red Hills, there is this place called Musafir Kana. Musafir, Musafir basically means uh, a traveler. Now, uh, giving a place for a traveler, it, it was the uh, the Waqif never said that if he is a traveler is a 
uh, Hindu or he traveled as a Muslim, you gave the buff. Therefore, it was meant for any person. Now, I will point out at later stage uh, as to how even the Holy Quran, the Noble Quran contemplates upon giving properties as buffs, which is contemplated in the Act of 1995 for the purpose of persons irrespective of their religion, which we are now slowly going back to the original definition of uh, Amir Ali, which he gave sometime in 19, 1892. Now, 1964 amendment, as I pointed out, is important because prior to 1964, uh, service norms are excluded. So are Musafir Khanas and Imam Baras. Now, the, this definition as given in 1964 continues even under, the, it was slightly tinkered with under the 1984 amendment, continues under the 1995 Act. Now, in 1984, several amendments were carried out, large-scale amendments, section 66A to section 66H, uh, I, I mean, several amendments were brought about. Yet again, there was a tussle between those who said that these amendments interfere with federalism and do not give the right aspiration of Muslims. There, and, there, and it also brought in the concept of uh, tribunals, that all this, though passed by the parliament, apart from two sections, namely the uh, extension of uh, limitation of uh, uh, period, a period of limitation from 12 years to 30 years, that is section 66G, and application of uh, uh, evacuee properties under 66, section 66H, apart from section 66G and H, but the other provisions are never notified. Now, one might ask, why limitation was brought in for section 12? I mean, from 12 years to 30 years. This, this, the, the, that we have to go to the next statute from WAF Act of 1954 to the Public WAF Extension of Limitation Act of 1959. Uh, it, has, it is very unfortunate this amendment, had, this act had to be made because it's, it relates back to the uh, partition of India. On 14th of August 1947, Pakistan was created. 15th, obviously, we were created. Now, a lot of Muslims in northern parts of India, especially Punjab and Uttar Pradesh, uh, had shifted their residence from uh, their respective places to Pakistan. And similarly, there was migration of Hindus from Pakistan, the present-day Pakistan, to India. A lot of them who, apart, I mean, most, a, a few of them who went, I shouldn't say a lot, a few of them who went away were Muttawalis of existing work institutions in India. Now, in... Uh, uh, 1947, when they left India and went to Pakistan, the property, the WAF property had, could not be taken care of. Just like uh, the properties of those who left Pakistan and came to India were occupied by the migrants, those whose properties were left back in India, including WAF properties, were occupied by uh, third parties who had no right to be in WAF properties in the first place. Now, therefore, the issue was whether limitation will apply for recovery of possession. Now, I pointed out in 54, properties had to be enumerated by the Commissioner of Surveys and submitted. This took a period of about five years. Uh, at least in Madras, I still see notifications, at least in so far as Tamil Nadu work code is concerned, I have seen notifications as late as 1960. So the survey went on for a period of nearly five years, from 1954, from 54 to uh, 1960. Now, in that period, they found that several properties which are WAFs of which, which were being administered by Mutawalis who were in India, but they have now since shifted to Pakistan. Now, when the WAF court came up with the suit for recovery of possession, the first defense was it is uh, barred by limitation because we have uh, got the right over the property by virtue of adverse possession. Now, if government, if the parliament had said once a WAF, always a WAF, or as in the present section uh, of the WAF Act, which excludes the period of limitation, that would have sufficed. But they brought in the uh, Public WAF Extension of Limitation Act of 1959. Now, under this legislation, the Act extended the period of limitation of suits, which expired after 14th of August 1947, that is the day on which Pakistan was created, to 7th of May 1954. 
that is the day on which the waf act of 1954 was enacted and these two dates were taken and it was extended to 15th of august 1967 therefore apart from the that is if the limitation had expired in 1954 12 years is 1969 uh, the uh, it was 1947 uh, to 12 is 1959 and it was extended for a period with which came to an end with 15th of august 1967 that is 20 20 years from the date on which india got independence this uh, this provision did no good because while uh, the the courts treated the extension of limitation in a very strict manner a very interesting judgment is a division bench of the andhra pradesh high court ar 1983 andhra pradesh page 57 this is uh, yeah that's the judgment ar 1983 andhra pradesh page uh, 57 now it was a division bench judgment which interpreted the public of extension of limitation act of 1959 very strictly and held that a mosque was being held in adverse position to that of the uh, i was at that of the interest of the waqf board now it's a settled principle of muslim law that once a waqf always a waqf and uh, apart from one separate instance of Uh, given by imam uh, hanifa where uh, he says that even mosque can be alienated all the others have taken a cumulative view that a mosque cannot be alienated at all now uh, adverse possession is the is one form of uh, grisa it's 83 andhra pradesh page 57 not 83 supreme court now uh, coming back now it is uh, once a mosque once a mosque has been dedicated to claim adverse position against the institution it doesn't satisfy the requirements of law will be my uh, respectful uh, submission uh, but however whether i like it or not uh, in uh, masjid shahid ganj a view had been taken that uh, a person in occupation of a property can take an adverse uh, can hold the property in adverse possession to that of the institution so therefore the public uh, the public of extension of limitation act of 1959 not being very helpful to institutions the waf act was substantially amended and by the parliament in 1984 and section 66 g was introduced where under the period of period of limitation for filing a suit for recovery of possession was kept raised from 12 years to 30 years now this 84 act as i pointed out contemplated about tribunals it expanded the definition of uh, waqfs it it did a great uh, i mean a uh, lot of uh, changes uh, the central waqf council a lot of things were done but due to the resistance of the state government saying the central government is trying to take more power excuse me central government is trying to take more power and uh, grabbing at the power of the state government the amendments were not notified finally the waqf committee was formed and an amendment was the uh, a comprehensive legislation was brought in under the waqf act of 1995 now under the waqf act of 1995 the definitions of the waqf which had been adopted in 1984 which had not been notified has been substantially brought in now by this definition it includes a waqf al aulad also what is a waqf al aulad the dedicator that the waqif decides that after him the property will go to his uh, descendants and if none of his descendants are alive it will go to something which is charitable now it the, the waf act itself doesn't contemplate something called waf wafala laulat simpliciter and wafala laulat composite but by judicial interpretation uh, just as imam ismail again and just imam ismail was also a, a standing counsel of the tamil nadu waf court and he was also the standing counsel for the nagur darga a man who, who knew his muslim law well he he had uh, surprisingly taken a view that a waqal al aulad simpliciter is outside the scope of the waqf act of either 1954 or i mean that judgment is still being applied now when that judgment was written sometime in 1980 uh, 1970s the judgment was 
AR 1979 Madras page 231. Uh, that is Tamil Nadu Work Board versus M Ibrahim Musviyar. This is 1979 Madras page 231. Equal into 1979 one MLJ page 189. A division bench of a division bench of Justice M M Ismail and uh, Justice Nainar Sundaram. Now by this judgment, the ju Justice M M Ismail had held. that in case it is uh, a wafala law simplicity it falls outside the scope of the waf act of 1954 now i have to point out here that the waf act underwent an amendment in 1984 it was not notified therefore the waf act of 1995 had come into force and under the waf act of 1995 if you see the definition of a wafala law Uh, if you see the definition of a wafala laula it to the extent which it is the, the definition today is the waf means uh, to the extent created to benefit the descendants of the waqifs now the, there is a uh, section 3 i'll read the the relevant portion of no don't do don't push section 3 sub clause r sub clause r of the waf act if you see the definition prior to the 2013 amendment it puts a wafala laula the extent to which the property is dedicated for any purpose recognized by muslim law as pious religious and charitable now we still follow the judgment of justice mm ismail in uh, musbi's case under the 2000 under the 1995 act uh, an argument is yet uh, taken up and decided by by the courts as to whether if wafala laula itself becomes is islamic and it is pious religious and charitable now what prevents the waf board from exercising jurisdiction over the entirety of the wafala laula so that issue is yet to be gone into maybe in an appropriate case when it comes up before the court the Court will necessarily have to find out whether the judgment of Justice uh, judgment in Ibrahim Musvi's case is uh, correct or whether it requires reconsideration. As of now, that is the present position. The wafala laula is, if it is simply sitter, it falls outside the jurisdiction of the waf board, and if it is composite, that is given to the descendants as well as to the uh, members of uh, uh, given to the descendants as well as for some public institution. Which is wafal laula composite? Then the waf board has jurisdiction to the extent to which it is being given to the public. Now the, this, as I pointed out, this is the this is of 1979 vintage. Subsequent to 1995, the case is yet to come. Hopefully, if it comes, we'll get an opportunity to go into that issue also. Now, under the waf act of 1995, substantially the same uh, provisions with respect to four, five, and six. That is the Appointment to the commissioner of for survey, uh, the submission of report to the state government, in turn the opinion of the waf board, and finally the notification by the central government by the state government has been maintained. One speciality is the note the creation of the waf. <laughs> Now under section six of the waf act, if a suit is before a suit had to be a party had to approach the jurisdiction of civil court. Now civil court's jurisdiction is ousted. and the party will have to approach the waf tribunal challenging the notification apart from that if there is any subsequent notification the period of limitation given does not stand extended now the uh, waf act of 1995 has also brought about a change in the uh, has uh, has retained the uh, brought about a change in the sense of while it is it continues to be the central waf council the central council waf council continues to have the role of aid and advice of the uh, central government one important uh, uh, duty which it seems to have been very faithfully executing is for granting of loans for development of waf properties so the this is not it been a subject matter of dispute because uh, those who appeared before the waf board i mean i used to do it till about a decade ago Uh, the waf board will have a separate agenda supplementary agenda to decide on the requests that are being made by mutawallis for funding 
for development of their work properties. And in case it is approved, it automatically it's a, a note is sent to the Central Work Council, which has been more than generous in granting the loans necessary. So I would say the purpose of the CWC today, the Central Work Council today, is only it's confined only in grant of uh, loans and advice. Uh, the body continues to be nominated by the uh, central government. It has no direct power when it comes to interference with individual uh, institutions. Whereas the power of the WAF board itself has been vastly expanded. And the WAF Act of 1995 today has literally replaced the civil court with the WAF board and the WAF tribunal. Now, the WAF Act is a very unique legislation uh, because if you read, if you see section 32 of the WAF Act, section 32 1 declares that the WAF board will have vast powers and superintendents over all WAFs situated in the state. Superintendents situated over all WAFs in the state. Now, which are the WAFs to which the Act applies? Please see section 2. It says it applies to all WAFs created, created either before or after the commencement of the Act and it, and it excludes only Darga Kwaja Sahib Ajmer to which the Darga Kwaja Sahib Ajmer Act of 1955 applies. Therefore, uh, as on today, there is no WAF which can stand outside the scope of the WAF Act. Now, please recollect what I said about Section 13 of the Musliman Act of 1923 and similar legislations at that time, where the power of exemption was granted to the central state uh, government and the central government to exempt institutions from the legislation. Now, as of today, there are there is no institutions which can be exempted by any by the state and the central government. Now, this is uh, this comprehensive uh, nature of the amendment which has come in 1995, it's relevant to take note. Now, then we come, go to the definition of a Muttawali. Now, who is a Muttawali? The confusion that the English judges had was that they thought Muttawali is a trustee. Now, Muttawali is not a trustee and can never be a trustee, though he performs duties of a trustee. Let me explain. In a trust, the property vests in the trustees. That is the test of a trust, whether the property vests in the trustees or on in any other body. If it vests in the trustees, by virtue of that vesting, the trustees have certain duties which we call as fiduciary duties. Now, under the WAF Act or the under the uh, pristine law of WAFs or under the WAF Act, the, the property never vests in the Muttawali. The Muttawali is a mere manager or a superintendent. The property always vests in the Almighty. Almighty is the owner of the property and his uh, uh, terrestrial manager is the Muttawali. Now, the British judges were not able to appreciate this subtle difference that is property vesting the Almighty and property vesting in the trustees. And they said the Muttawali is akin to a trustee. The Muttawali performs the duties of a trust. What are the nature and duties of the trust is now enumerated under the Waf Act of 1995. The, can, a, can a woman be a Muttawali? Now that is because now uh, there, are, there have been demands uh, saying that uh, there must be equality in status and all that. I am touching upon that issue. Um, there is no bar of a woman or even a Hindu from being a Muttawali. The only bar is that in case they, the office involves religious aspects also, then a woman or a, that is like a, a kanka. I, I take the example of a kanka. Kanka means uh, an institution where the person sits and gives instructions to his disciples. Uh, those who have seen the, uh, who have read that something about, uh, read about Sufism, there is a concept of the peer and the murshid. The peer will be sitting on a mat, he'll be giving lectures, and the murid, he'll be sitting on the floor listening to him. The concept of silsila, the silsila basically means a chain where the peer and the murid together form a chain and one nominates his uh, 
success hai so if this in this uh, in this kind of a institution say a kanka or a darga uh, a woman cannot be a, uh, a mutawalli but however if the job does not involve any religious uh, aspects a, a mutawalli can be from a, from the uh, female categories now the example i would give is the very recent judgment of sayed nazira khatun versus sayed zahuruddin ahmed baghdadi that is uh, in 2019 ah yes sayed nazira khatun versus sayed zahuruddin ahmed baghdadi that this sayed ahmed sayed zahuruddin ahmed baghdadi i have given the uh, citation the link itself you click it opens in the kanun citation now uh, this was this is a very interesting case because the commissioner of works board of uh, board of works in west bengal appointed a lady to a kanka now as a commissioner of works he must have been aware of the practice and customs of the uh, of, of muslims and should not have appointed a muslim uh, a muslim woman to be the head of a kanka but nonetheless he was appointed she was appointed this was challenged before the uh, waf tribunal and the waf tribunal said nothing doing Uh, a mutawalli cannot. Uh, the two issues had been raised: whether a mutawalli can alienate his office uh, during his lifetime, and whether a female can be appointed. The tribunals uh, agreed with it, and they said a mutawalli cannot alienate his office. That is another test. Uh, a trustee can resign. A mutawalli can also resign if the resignation is accepted by the waf court today, but normally they do not. but can he appoint an assistant to assist him in his performance of duties yes he can that is the concept of naib mutawalli naib basically means a deputy under the original definition of a mutawalli he was excluded but now under the expanded definition of a mutawalli under the waf act he is also included uh, the supreme court the matter went up finally to the supreme court and the supreme court applied uh, the same judgment of justice the the uh, that the same bench consisting of justice ramana mona shanta gowder and uh, ajay justice ajay rastogi which applied custom and usage to uh, muslims despite the sharia act got it right that this got it right this time with great respect to them got it right this time and they held that uh, a, a woman can or can be a mutawalli however if it has religious duties she cannot be appointed. and second and consequently they said for a kanka a woman cannot be a mutawalli and uh, they also confirmed the pristine uh, view of uh, muslim law that uh, a mutawalli cannot alienate his office or transfer his office to but he is entitled to appoint a deputy now the deputies used to escape did now the waf act has given an expanded definition it includes a naib mutawalli it includes a, a khadim it includes a mujawar mujawar is a servant and it also includes a sajida e nashin sajida e nashin i pointed out who heads a darga or a kanka technically he is a religious head but where the office is mixed with temporal as well as spiritual he will be answerable to the board as a mutawalli in charge because of the temporal activities but he will be excluded from his role when he is dealing with sajida nashin in the religious activity so that is the kind of expansive definition is given before a de facto mutawalli or a uh, middlesome interloper or a wayfarer of a waf property could not be treated as a uh, mutawalli now under the definition an interloper a person who is managing the waf but has not been appointed by the waf court or the state government under section 66 under certain circumstances can be appointed or appointed temporarily by the under the waf act under the 63 even such persons can, are treated as mutawallis by virtue of the de facto doctor so if you are treating a waf property and are managing it the waf board can exercise jurisdiction over you because you are a mutawalli now then we go to the aspect on uh, um, uh, whether the office of mutawalli is hereditary now the office of mutawalli is not treated hereditary but if the waqif has given a cont as contemplated a manner of succession then the waf board which is the appointing authority today should give preference 
to the wishes of the wakil after all the gentleman in hoping that he will get a place in uh, jannat and allah taala takes him back has dedicated this property to the uh, public and on the uh, given the property in the name of allah now if he has a wish it can be only treated as a pious wish but it is not binding on the appointing authority so a preference will be given but the the wuf can always uh, the wuf court can always say appointing x who is a descendant will not be in the interest of the wuf it can always appoint y now does the wuf act of 1995 fix the remuneration for a mutawalli no it does not fix however since the wuf act under section 25 Uh, under 26 and 32 demands the wuf board to um, follow the principle the principles and edicts of islam the wuf board would be entitled to uh, to take uh, to fix as much as 1/10 of its income towards the remuneration of mutawalli now uh, would would we, i would i would say no mutawalli worth a shawl salt should take money from the wuf in order to maintain it other than of course paying the government taxes etc and the uh, particularly the contribution of the wuf board of 7% but should he take a money for himself i remember of reading about uh, uh, king solomon who was known as sulaiman just permit me to transgress uh, for a couple of seconds, minutes now he he had the the almighty had given the power to uh, king solomon to understand the language of the birds now there was this he had a habit of feeding this bird regularly and this bird came to him and said please give me food it was the holy month of uh, rabiul awal which is what uh, the ramzan that he was going so he said i will first go perform my prayers and then come and feed you the bird is said to have told him if you are not going to give me food now i will go to the mosque i will pluck a leaf and come i will pluck a leaf and i'll come and leave it on your rooftop king solomon was so shuddered thinking that a leaf from a mosque will take away his uh, uh, his role of his duty as a mutawalli of the institution or the temple dedicated to the name of the almighty he immediately rushed and got the uh, gave the food to the bird i'm giving as an example because the property belongs to the almighty the mutawalli must feel honored that he has been appointed to take care of the almighty's property in this uh, transitory abode if he is going to take money from it i don't know it's finally for the almighty to decide on the day of uh, qiyamah but nonetheless does the wuf board have the power to fix the uh, remuneration for a mutawalli yes it does it can fix up up to 1/10 of the income of the wuf not value of the wuf please note income of the wuf as uh, remuneration now on whom the can a mutawalli spend here the obvious the obvious answer as uh, i have given in the note is as per the direction of the wakif the purpose of the institution and for the beneficiaries now beneficiaries especially especially if it is a wafal alawla but my reading of the uh, holy and noble quran uh, obviously it has been in only in english i came across one particular verse in surah al barak bakara now verse number 215 please see see what it uh, reads chapter 2 is uh, surah al bakara it says they ask you what they should spend in the way of allah say whatever you spend of good in the way of allah must be parents and the near of the kin and the orphans and the needy and the stranded and whatever do whatever you do of good truly allah knows it well therefore applying this uh, principle which has been uh, the unquestionable principle which has been uh, encapsulated in verse uh, chapter 2 verse 2 and 5 if a mutawalli is going to take care of the institution first there are obviously taxes to be paid maintenance of the mosque imam bara etc thereafter the uh on the directions of the wakif and if he goes on to spend on the poor the needy and the stranded the stranded is what the concept of musafir kana 
instead of a person sleeping on the road a musafir khana is constructed um, and he can go in wali uh, pukargal that is the right word in tamil i think for them to go in uh, stay chatram just like a chatram that will also answer now if the mutawalli is going to spend on himself and on a litigation it attracts the curse of the wafaq because the wafaq specifically says the mutawalli should not spend the money of the waf in his own defense now then uh, i go move on to criminalization uh, criminalization which is contemplated under the wafaq prior to 1995 and the unnotified waf amendment act of 1984 it was only the state of uttar pradesh which contemplated uh, a waf tribunal the waf tribunal was a district judge and now a district judge has like the district collector is now wearing several hats um, under the essential commodities act you name it it finally lands on his table the poor man was mulcted along along by the up legislative assembly to deal with wafs also it found it was not apart from increasing the cost of litigation and the time of litigation they found that it was not being helpful at all but uh, what happened is the waf act therefore under the waf act they wanted to create a separate tribunal now what did the state of tamil nadu do it imitated the state of uttar pradesh and said all principal subordinate judges in the districts will be the waf tribunal from 111996 in other words uh, as i pointed out what the, the the contemplation was to have a specialized tribunal which will deal exclusively with the waf act instead of that we had the civil judges who are I and mean, i'm not blaming them they already have a lot of work in addition that they are you had given some more work to them and by virtue of it there was absolutely no progress this brought in the uh, waf amendment act of uh, 2013 where it was made a multi member tribunal now what is the multi member tribunal having now it has a a, a, a person from the district judiciary uh, now it is uh, this is balkis banu who is uh, in chennai then it has a member of the revenue service and a member selected from by the bar council and the government by way of an interview the high court has to have a high court and the government have to relook at the rules again the waf tribunal is functioning it is vibrant but the difficulty we face is all three of them have to sit and all three of them have to uh, pronounce a judgment now if one of them is absent the waf tribunal comes to waf tribunal is totally paralyzed so there is a functional the tribunalization has happened the judiciary has a role into it the district judge is there the revenue department also has a role and the lawyers also are represented but still it requires some tinkering in the rules but not in the act itself now then i would uh, has the tribunal totally excluded the jurisdiction of the civil court i would say no the jurisdiction of the civil court continues to uh, be there now uh, in matters which the tribunal does not have jurisdiction over uh, if you see the judgment of uh, uh, ramesh gobindaram versus uh, kugra umayu mayan waf justice uh, takur and justice uh, uh, kadju they would have taken a view that the civil court has a jurisdiction and therefore the waf tribunal has no jurisdiction now this is the reverse of the test which has been recently uh, applied by the uh, supreme court where they have said the test that should be seen <coughs> is whether the um, waf board whether the waf tribunal excludes the jurisdiction of the civil court under section 83 to 95 now if the waf waf, waf tribunal has jurisdiction the civil court has no jurisdiction but vice versa is not true if the civil court has jurisdiction does not mean the waf tribunal cannot go into it uh, for example in dulabai's case gives certain examples where even though the, the jurisdiction of civil court is excluded certain instances it can uh, uh, interfere i can immediately recollect of the case of karnataka state waf board versus union of india so this was a case where Uh, an archaeological a suit was presented by the the Karnataka State Waf Board against uh, the Union of India for a declaration. 
that certain archaeological sites in Karnataka are waf properties. These waf properties, the these institutions were uh, motif were seen by the archaeological survey and were under their control. But the waf board wanted to take over control of these institutions. When this dispute came before court, the court said if the survey commissioner had issued notice to the parties and had conducted an inquiry and had published notification, then it is binding on parties. However, merely because the government of Karnataka is issuing the gazette does not mean it has knowledge of the survey. Why I am giving this example? If you we pick the principles of Dulabai, you can, uh, if the act contemplates a particular manner and that particular scheme is violated, then civil court has a jurisdiction. I am giving this as an example to show uh, there are certain instances where 85 the exclusion of the civil court with respect to jurisdiction being exercised by the uh, WAF tribunal, civil court has no jurisdiction under, uh, still, if you are able to bring under the exceptions of Dulabai, civil court will also have jurisdiction. Now, who can approach a tribunal? If you read the definition of the WAF Act, it speaks about a mutawali, it speaks about the WAF court, and it also speaks about a person interested in the WAF. Now, Please note, it, a person interested in the WAF, the definition that is given is a person can be who is getting benefits from the institution. Now, if you go to uh, Nagur Darga or the uh, Darga in Ramnad, uh, you have more persons coming from Kerala and Tamil Nadu who are Hindus. There are more Hindus and lesser uh, Muslims who are uh, certain areas and during certain times visiting these institutions. They do gain benefits. Therefore, if you apply the uh, or the example of the Mastan Darga in Nellur, you will have a lot of children in Nellur whose name are Mastan Riddi or Mastan Naidu, and they will be Hindus. The, the, the belief there is if you go to the Darga and pray, uh, if you are childless, you will, you will give you will get for your the you will be blessed to the child by the Almighty. Therefore, if you read the extended definition of a person interested in a waf under the WAF Act of 1995, it will include any person who is the relevant provision is section 3 subclause subclause K. It deals with any person who, who is received pecuniary or other benefits from the WAF and it's an inclusive definition and it includes the person who has a right to offer prayer to perform any religious rite in a mosque, Idga, Imambara, Darga, Kanka, Pirkana, Karbala, etc. and etc. Therefore, being an inclusive definition, any person can bring forth, can move the tribunal. Now, here there is an interesting judgment of Justice Ye Selvam in MK Sultan versus Amit Shafi. It was a case where the, uh, the, the issue that was being raised is the Mutawali has not filed the suit. If you see section 32, present 32, and old section 15, the WAF board is given the power to present the suit. So the argument was only the WAF board can file a suit and any third party who is going to file the suit, the suit is not maintainable. It was effectively rejected by uh, Justice A. Selvam. It is a judgment worth reading wherein he said even a worshipper can file a suit. Therefore, if a worshipper can approach the civil court, the same rules can be made applicable even to the WAF tribunal. Now, this comes to the most important aspect of the WAF Act. There are several, uh, oh, um, sorry, I should bring forth one more. The, uh, under the section 7.5 of the WAF Act of 1995, if any proceeding is pending before the civil court, it continues, it has to continue and will follow the same uh, rights as, as in the situation of a regular civil suit. And the formation of the WAF tribunal under section 83 will not take it away. Now, one important aspect of the WAF Act is the finality given to orders of the uh, certain authorities under the uh, Act. Now, if you see the, I'll give, just read out a few sections. Section 7, 26, 32, 33, 40, 48, 52, 55A, 64, 65, 2, 67, 69, 3, 72, 7, 
73 and 78. These are provisions about a bunch of about 10 provisions which give finality to the orders passed by the uh, authorities. If you take the if you take section uh, uh, 72 7 the budget is approved by the chief executive officer. Now the chief executive officer is not a part of the work code under section 14 of the work pack. The work board consists of uh, two uh, MLA, MP, uh, bar council members, Muttavallis and nominees of the government. And they will get together and elect the chairman. The chief executive officer of, the, of any work board is only the ex officio secretary. If he is an ex officio secretary, what is his role? Now he only advises the work board. In case the work board passes an order contrary to law, then he can reserve it to the approval of the government under section 626. This is an exceptional power, normally not exercised by, I have not seen any instance so far uh, in these 20 years. But this power exists with the chief executive officer where he can say that I do not agree with the decision of the work board. I am referring to the consideration. I am saying this is why I am pointing out the CEO is a part of the work board is only an ex officio secretary. The second uh, person who comes along uh, in, in under the uh, work act is the board itself. Now, when a budget is approved, it is approved by the chief executive officer. The Mutavali can feel aggrieved by that. And he prefers an appeal to the WAF board. He does not go to the WAF tribunal. Similarly, if the power of direct management under section 65 is given to the WAF board, as against the order of the WAF board, an appeal lies to the uh, state government. And the order of the state government is similarly, if there is a um, under section uh, 71 or 74 or under section 61 or uh, section 64. If any order is passed by the survey commissioner or by matters referred to therein under the section 7, appeal lies to the tribunal. Now, the order of the tribunal is given a finality. There are uh, these finality is given to orders passed by the government, finality is given to orders under certain sections, the orders passed by the WAF court, finality is given to orders passed by the uh, WAF tribunal. Now, why is this relevant? If you see the judgment of uh, um, what, should, what I call the as the king of alternate remedies, Justice uh, Kaju, in uh, Board of West, West Bengal versus Anis Fatima Begum, that is 2012 12 ACC 12 scale page 323. He said, even if the WAF board does, if you approach the WAF board, the WAF board doesn't pass an order, go to the WAF tribunal. If the WAF board passes an order, go to the WAF tribunal. Don't come to the high court. Now, it's good to say that uh, I will follow alternate remedy. This is actually finally a the constitutional philosophy of each individual judge. But then under the act, when uh, finality is given to the provision, what is the meaning of finality? The statute contemplates that the authority who passes the order, his or, his or her order should not be questioned or appealed against under that act. Now, uh, those who have dealt with uh, um, government arbitrations are very well aware. The arbitration provisions, there are certainly certain clauses which says the decision of the chief, chief engineer under this category shall be final. If this cannot be a subject matter of arbitration. There's something similar to that where the act itself contemplates the order passed by the WAF tribunal or the WAF board or the government or the chief executive, not the chief executive officer or the uh, uh, shall be shall become final. How does it make a difference? You know, there are a list of sections which uh, Raghun, ah, the sections are there. If you mm -hmm. see sections, you'll be surprised to note, even when finality is given, a revision is preferred to the High Court under Section 83.9. Uh, proviso. Now, under Section 83, um, under somebody wants a citation. It is 2000, citation of Justice Kadju's 2012, 12 scale, page 323. Now, the once the finality is given to an order, uh, whether statutorily or I can use the example of uh, Kyoto Holland was Zachilu, that is the 10th schedule of the constitution, the finality is given to the order passed by the speaker. That is not challengeable except by way of resort to Article 226 or uh, Section Article uh, 32 or maybe even 136 because of plenary power. Now, 
the irres because of this judgment of the uh, as honorable supreme court of justice kardju now we have the waf tribunal being flooded with litigations even with respect to orders which are not susceptible to challenge though which have been given a finality apart from that if a waf tribunal passes an order in even when the order of the waf tribunal is given finality it is being challenged before the high court under 839 now the power under 839 that is the power of revision which has been the power of appeal has been totally taken away under the 1995 act and power of revision has been granted if power of revision is given that should be exercised in accordance with the act and if the contemplates a finality to the order of the tribunal the high court should respect it instead of doing so we find all orders which are being passed by the tribunal are being invariably challenged before the high court now if the uh, should a ubi just ibi remedium is a settled principle if a person loses uh, before the waf tribunal and an order has been given a finality now or before the government let us say the direct management has been taken under section 65 appeal has been filed before the state government and the state government has also rejected he cannot go before the waf tribunal and the waf tribunal should not exercise jurisdiction because order of the waf tribunal as of, uh, of the state government has been given a finality under section 65 i am taking just an instance now under such circumstances should a person who loses before the state government be without a remedy no my answer is no the person has a remedy the power under article 226 or 227 is not barred and in fact even as against an order passed by a waf tribunal where not a finality has been given say for example under section 61 or 7 i would say repetition is maintainable now i have given uh, certain english authorities and i would and i would argue that a repetition is maintainable however there are uh, two judgments of the madras high court uh, one of justice dr swaminathan in t rangarajan versus Ra v ramachandran and approving the judgment the judgment of the division bench of the first court that is es sundara mahalingam versus special tribunal where they have held that if the tribunal is headed by one of the reasons that they have held that a repetition under article 226 is not maintainable and only 227 because they have referred to the radesham judgment which was subsequently overruled saying a writ is not maintainable as against a body of which an officer is a judicial officer now i would say both these judgments uh, can be relooked in the light of the judgment of the recent judgment of justice rama subramanian in embassy property developments versus state of karnataka that is 2019 17 scale page 37 wherein is large be held a writ petition under article 226 is maintainable even against an order passed by the nclt or the nclat let us forget the tribunal being headed by a district judge he has said that even if the tribunal as a person who is a retired judge of the high court or a retired judge of the supreme court a writ petition under 226 is maintainable therefore the it is time the high court started enforcing section 839 proviso in the light of the finality clauses that has been contemplated by the parliament under the waf act of 1995 now finally i'd go to the last to the penultimate issue as to to whom uh, the act applies as i pointed out from section 2 it applies across the board the only person it excludes is the only institution it excludes is the khwaja uh, this the ajmer darga and the ajmer darga has a separate legislation now there there is a act called the prince of arkad endowments act of 1922 it has the deals with properties in tirichi uh, chennai and there's three schedules the act contemplated the district collector of uh, tirichirappalli to interfere with the uh, with the orders passed by the prince of arkad but he signed as the prince of arkad endowments now an argument was raised before the high court saying that the waf board has no jurisdiction uh, in a in a judgment rendered by justice pk mishra and justice chitra venkatraman in 2006 Three MLJ page 856. The division bench took a view that though there is a statute, the content of the statute, the the first the super the high court uh, the the division bench held this has now been confirmed by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held that the Prince of Arkad endowments is covered under the Waf Act of 1995. The Muttavali or the Prince of Arkad endowments is should be deemed to be a Muttavali under the Waf Act of 1995, and This this is the uh, uh, very fine distinction brought out by Justice Gitram. She holds 
that the scheme contemplated under the WFA, under the Prince of Arcade Endowments of 1922 will be deemed to be a scheme under the uh, WAF Act of 1995. In other words, it was as instead of removing the instead of keeping the category away, saying it is a, a scheme contemplated by state legislature by virtue of the expanded meaning given to Section 2. There are no WAFs which today stands excluded under the WAF Act of 1995. It is in this view, I said, the view of uh, uh, Justice M.M. Uh, Ismail requires reconsideration. Now, most importantly is this has not been utilized by the uh, court so far. Section 108, capital A of the WAF Act of 1995. This came in by way of an amendment in 2013. It has literally said, notwithstanding anything contained in any other law for the time being in force, insofar as WAF is concerned, only the WAF Act will be applicable. Now, this is a statutory recognition that the WAF Act is a complete code, and when matters relating to WAF, you need not look outside. Your answers are under the WAF Act of 1995. Now, are these is the WAF Act of 1995 uh, complete? I would say it is a complete quote, but still requires certain uh, amendments, which hopefully the government will carry it out shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. I think uh, very, very illustrative um, session and uh, the way in which you have put forth things uh, in the form of your notes with um, highlighted uh, links to these judgments is something very unique. Uh, anybody, sir? Um, Thank you so much, uh, Sanjay. It was a learning experience for me, and I'm sure that it was a learning experience for all the listeners. It was so special because it was a special day, Ramzan. It was on top facts, and it was rendered by Sanjay. So it is, it is, it is that special, and uh, that shows the greatness of this country. So uh, it was, uh, it was a pleasure listening to you and. Uh, there was a lot of clarity in understanding the whole thing and I, I only uh, request the listeners to uh, first uh, go to the YouTube and listen what he said about the broad view of all these things and then thereafter if you listen to the present uh, lecture, uh, there will be a lot of clarity. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your time. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I learned a lot of things by you. As it's why I'm only shooting from shoulders of giants. I mean, um, if not for uh, Mr. Abdul Razak or uh, the others who have taught me WAF law, I would not have understood. It's just that they were, I'm standing on their shoulders and shooting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hammer um, Sambatna. Sanjay, thanks a lot for clarifying all the minor issues because most people don't understand the work fact. Um, it's been made complicated because uh, we are not used to the terms and uh, uh, the procedure. So I am sure all the persons who are not familiar with the WAKFAC would have profited by it. And thank you very much for the notes. I immediately emailed it to myself because I delete all the WhatsApp messages. So I can, um, instead of bugging you for uh, judgments, I can straight away go to your notes and uh, find the answers. And I hope you will keep them updated. As and when you I mean, find the uh, I, I, I hope they are not cited against me in court. <laughs> no, uh, we, no, no, Sanjay, we are always been sailing together. <laughs> no, we are never appeared for trespassers or uh, illegal uh, occupants. So I am always in the in velvet because I am always sailing with Sanjay, and I'll wait for him to turn up before I start arguing. My God! <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Previous Giridhar question was uh, different, uh, Sanjay. Uh, you can answer that question also. My question was, you said in 1995, the uh, 1995 work pack was not notified except for two provisions. There 1984. Are... 84. Sorry. 84. 1984, Rough Amendment Act of 1984, yeah. which ended a lot of provisions under the WAF Act of 1954. Okay. Section 66G and H. The other provisions were not notified at all. All right, all right. So, 1995 Act is notified completely, is it? No, no. It has been notified from 1 1 1996. The amendments which it has been, substantial amendments which were done in 2013, have been notified of the effect from 1 1 2013, which includes the 
rough uh, lease rules of 2014 so substantially the, the rough act all right, all right i was mistaken fine thank you thank you it was a wonderful lecture i didn't know anything about this subject now i think i know something you you oh, okay and uh, to ask <laughs> to answer the question on section 75 yeah yeah there is one question uh, mr dennis has asked are you sure it yeah the answer What is this is... mm. the view taken by the rajasthan high court in najmul hussain's case was that by virtue of enactment of the waf act of 1995 all matters even pending before the civil court prior to the constitution of the waf tribunal that is insofar as tamil nadu is concerned before 11 1996 the there is no difference whether the suits are pending before or after the waf act was come into force all suits will go to the waf tribunal in other words irrespective of the nature of uh, date of presentation of the plaint the property the, the suits have to be sent to the waf tribunal that judgment was reversed by the supreme court and it was held that if under by virtue of section 75 of the waf act if suits are presented before 11 1996 they will be tried by the civil court itself and it shall not affect the uh, suitors if it is filed after 11 1996 you will have to go only before the waf tribunal now why this makes a very important difference for lawyers is if it is present one before 11 1996 it should have been presented either before a municipal court or before a sub court if it is presented before either of these courts then appeal to a district judge or appeal lies to the high court as a first appeal or a second appeal to the uh, uh, high court so this the the revenue the avenue of litigation is different if suits are already pending but if such suits are transferred to waf tribunal advocates will have to have to have it trans transferred back to civil court that is the idea behind section 75 thank you thank you sanjay for the thank you thank you, thank you thank you thanks a lot thank you.